Good morning, friends. Happy Easter. He is risen. Go ahead and stand. We're going to open with a familiar chorus. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Sing this out together. Praise to the Lord. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is your health and salvation. Come all who hear, now to His temple draw near. Join me in glad together praise the Lord. praise to the Lord above all things so wondrously reigning shelters you under his wings and so gently sustaining have you not seen all that is needful has been sent by his gracious sword He is, risen. he is risen. It's really good to have you with us this morning for our Easter service, especially if you are, are new. Uh, we would love to connect with you beyond Sunday morning. There's a, a hello card uh, in the chair back in front of you. If you'd like for us to reach out to you and connect, uh, we'd love to do that. You can fill out that hello card and you can drop it in the gift and offering box or hand it to me on your way out uh, this morning. Um, also in the chair backs in front of you, there are our prayer cards. We would love to, to pray for you if there's any way we can do that. Uh, whether this is your first time or you come every week, uh, we want to pray for you. Uh, so you can grab one of those cards, you can fill it out. Again, drop it in the gifts and offering box. Or you can hand that prayer card uh, to me as well on your, your way out. With that, I want to use uh, Psalm 118 as a way to draw our hearts that uh, we believe we are worshiping a risen Savior this morning. A God who is present to us and alive. 
And so Psalm 18 is a classic Easter psalm. So let me read this for us as we turn our attention to the risen Lord. Psalm 118. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. So let us rejoice and be glad in it. Would you stand as we continue to sing? In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love! is 
morning that you are powerful, that you have defeated death in your resurrection, and that we, united with you by faith, are also reborn into new life. Thank you for that gospel truth this Easter Sunday. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please remain standing for the reading of God's word. Our scripture reading today comes from Luke 24, verses 1 through 12. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. And they found the stone, the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words and returned from the tomb and reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now they were Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James. Also the other women were with them, were telling these things to the apostles. But these words appeared to them as nonsense, and they would not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen wrappings only, and went away to his home, marveling at what had happened. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, before we jump into that text, uh, let's, let us pray. <clears throat> Father, as we open 
we open your word, we open it because we are confident that you, you want to speak to each person in this room. Uh, wherever they're at on the continuum of belief, whatever they think of the, the resurrection, claims of Jesus, God, wherever we are this morning, you, I know you want to speak to us. And so I pray, Spirit, would you do your work and speak? In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm a uh, person that is not capable of nuance. As everything for me is, is black and white. There is there's very little gray. And that can be a, a blessing. It can also be a curse. You just ask my wife. So I was in Glacier National Park this past fall, and uh, I was excited to go because it's described as the hiker's park. There's incredible hikes all through Glacier. So I did lots of research, lots of study to so- decide what are the hikes I want to go on. And I get there, and I get ready for my first hike. And unlike everyone else who just walks onto the trail and goes after it, I stop at the trailhead to read the sign, to read all that you're supposed to read before you go into the wilderness of Glacier. Because Glacier is one of the most remote national parks. And so the wildlife kind of run the show there, even more so than most national parks. So I stop to actually read the signs, and this is the, what the sign there reads. You are entering a wilderness area and must accept certain inherent dangers. That's why I'm here. Including snow and steep terrain, water, wildlife, there is no guarantee of your safety. It's like, listen, wherever I walk, I can't guarantee anyone their safety because of me. I keep reading on to the section about bears. Bears have injured and killed visitors and may attack without warning for no apparent reason. Thankfully, I had done my research, so I had my bear spray ready to go. I was like, I'm good. So I I go down to read the section on the bear spray. And the section on the bear spray says, only use bear spray as a last resort Bear spray may further provoke bears and invite further attack. Which is this, what are we, like, why do I even have this then? All that this can do is apparently make the bear angrier at me, so why do I have, like, why do I have this? And then I, I kept, this is an actual National Parks sign. This is what it says about, when it gives you the details about what happens if a bear attacks. If a bear attacks, again, an actual National Park sign. If a bear attacks, fight a black bear. If a grizzly bear attacks you, play dead. If it starts to eat you, fight back. <laughs> At this point, uh, as someone who has no nuance, I'm like, I, I'm pretty sure whoever wrote this sign, what they're actually saying is, Tim, you shouldn't be here. What are you doing here? Go back to Kansas and the suburbs where you belong. So I'm standing there at the the trailhead reading these signs. And past me, all these people are walking. They're laughing. They're giggling. They got their cute Patagonia fleece on. And it's like, do you understand what you're walking into? There are bears everywhere. And apparently they will attack you without warning for no reason. And your weapons are useless against them. What are you doing? And they have no idea because they don't read the signs. So that is what it's like to live life without nuance. As I actually read the signs, because you're supposed to. (laughs) Easter for me is a day that comes with no nuance. Either what we're saying, which is pretty outrageous, that Jesus rose from the dead, is, is true and it changes everything. Or it's not. And what are what are we doing, right? Like, I'm glad you got your pastels on. Joseph's rocking his suit for the one day this year that he's going to rock his, rock his suit. I mean, we're, all, we're going to go, you know, Easter egg hunting, have some nice ham later. So like, like that, if, if Jesus is not raised from the dead, enjoy your day. Live it up while you can before the bears get you. Or it's this happened. So I want to, I want to invite you actually to, to have a, an Easter service without nuance. That either Jesus has rose from the dead and it, it's the most important thing about you. Whatever you walked into, thinking, wrestling through, the questions you have, the frustrations that that are marking your life, those are less important if Jesus is raised from the dead than the fact that Jesus has been raised from the dead. Or it's it's not true. So I but don't live in that middle ground. I don't want to I don't want to have an Easter service where we live in the, oh isn't this nice? No, 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 no. Either Jesus is alive and he's loose in the world, or he's not. 
So what I want to do, I want to just invite you to do what I did, which is stand and actually read the sign before you go on onto the hike. And that sign, you know, there's, there was two promises, to, or two, two words to that, that sign at the, the trailhead. There was a warning and there was a promise. So it's the warning of Easter and the promise of Easter. At first, the, the warning. And again, I just want to say, I, like, I am fully cognizant of the fact, and, and I hope you are too, that we're, like, we're all just standing up here claiming that Jesus, that a human being died and is alive somewhere. Like, it's a pretty outrageous thing, because I, I don't know of any other human beings that I would say that about. That, that, that's not a believable statement. And, and so I, we just need to enter into just our minds for a minute, not, not just to skip past that, but to actually think about that. And I, I just want to say, if, if you're a Christian and you believe in the resurrection, or if you're, you don't yet, I just want to say it's, it is actually intellectually credible to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. You can actually like, have your brain fully functioning and believe the best uh, read of what happened 2,000 years ago is that Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead. I want to give you two reasons out of this text. The first is that as you read this story, the disciples are not depicted as the heroes. See, what a lot of people would say is, listen, the, the early church, they made up the resurrection. It's not real. Uh, you know, the, it's, it's a made-up story. Jesus died, they, you know, the disciples felt bad, and they, they can kind of sort of concocted a story to, to make themselves feel better, that Jesus lived in their hearts, or whatever. And I just was like, if this is the story you're going to make up, that, that doesn't make much sense to me. I mean, we're, we're, last week we entered into the fact Peter denied Jesus three times. Like, why would you tell that about yourself if you were making up a story, that you as the, the sort of lead apostle was a denier of Jesus? But even more than that, the disciples themselves are depicted as unbelieving, obstinate, doubters, while women are, are depicted as the ones who actually get it. That's important because in this day, women were seen as, as second-class citizens. They weren't, their witness was not even accepted in court. And yet, what we read in Luke 24 is that the first people to witness the resurrection and believe in it are women. It is Mary Magdalene. It is Joanna. It's Mary, the mother of James. So just... So just go with me for a minute. Just imagine you're the disciples. Jesus is dead, and it's like, okay, we have to make, up, we have to make something up to get, get our religion going. And they all gather around. Like, okay, here's what we're going to make up. Uh, women, whose testimony is not admissible in court, they're going to be the first ones who believe in Jesus in the resurrection. And they're going to see it, they're going to believe it, and then they're going to come to the men, and we're not going to believe them. We're going to reject their testimony. We're, going to, we're, going to, we're not going to listen to them. And the women are going to keep telling the men, no, this is actually true. This is actually true. And, and believe it or not, the men will not listen to the women, even though the women are right. And Jesus himself will have to come in his own physical body and say, I am raised from the dead. And even then, we'll read in a second, they still doubt it. Like, why would you, if you're, if you're trying to start a religion, why would you start with, hey, like, I'm a, I'm a massive failure. At, at, the own, at the very thing I'm telling you is... Is true. This just it does not make, a, make sense as a made up story. The disciples are not depicted as heroic. But secondly, and more importantly, I, th I think we have to remember no one thought a resurrection was even possible in this day. Now we, we, I think, at times are a little bit of, of what C.S. Lewis called a, a chronological snobbery, which is we, we think we're so much more sophisticated than the people that came. Before us, and often it's like, well, you know, people back then they would kind of believe anything, and they would believe people rose from the dead. And it's like, no, no, they didn't. They were human beings who saw human beings die; they would bury them, and then it's not like they expected the human beings to pop back up again. People died, and we've been dying for centuries, and people don't rise from the dead. So, so N.T. Wright did a, did a lengthy study at the first century just to ask: Did people actually think someone could be risen from the dead in the first century? And here's his. His response to looking at all of the first century evidence, the Greek, the Roman, all different religions, asking the question, did anybody believe a human being would be raised from the dead? And here's his conclusion. The historical evidence was massive and the conclusion universally drawn. Ancient paganism contains all kinds of theories, but whenever resurrection is mentioned, the answer is a firm negative. We know that doesn't happen. And you see this in the narrative. The women, Jesus has died, in verse 1, we read, On the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. So the women, they go to the tomb expecting to find a dead body. Because when people die, they are dead. They don't rise to 
life. And even after the women see this and go to the disciples, and remember, this, these, are, these are people who are very close relationally. Like, you'd expect the disciples to believe the women, but we read, as they were returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James, and other women with them also told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. Because no one believes that human beings are raised from the dead. It, it, it's not like they were just waiting and then would believe anything. No, it took a lot of convincing the earliest disciples to believe that Jesus actually was raised from the dead. So the question becomes, well, how did they become, begin to believe that? So again, N.T. Wright, he, he writes this, reflecting on how the church came to believe in resurrection in all these ways, the belief of the early church about resurrection was a radical departure in the history of human culture and thought. There was no debate within the early church. This new belief was instant. So what's right, what Wright is saying is, no one in the first century believed an individual would be raised from the dead. And then all of a sudden, this, this church, this community of people, in an instant, unanimously agree Jesus is raised from the dead, and they build a religion Around it. In fact, one of the reasons we're worshiping on Sunday morning right now instead of Saturday, the, the traditional Jewish day of worship, is because Christians move that day of worship so that each week we, when we gather Sunday morning, we're recreating the moment when the empty tomb was discovered. We are empty tomb believers. That's why we worship on Sunday, not on Saturday. So, so all that to say, I, I'm not going to pretend like you know, a few minutes overcomes all the intellectual questions and doubts and you know, debates about a human being rising from the dead. All I'm saying is, how do you explain the sudden emergence of this new idea and, and hundreds, thousands of people believing in it, a religion that's now spread to every corner of the world? How do you explain that without an actual resurrection? And there, there are people who try and do. But how do you explain that? So all, all I'm saying is, if, you, if this morning you believe that a dead man rose from the, the dead... It's intellectually credible. There's so, much, there's so many signs pointing that direction. But I said Easter has a warning, so what is it? What, what is the warning of Easter? If, if we can intellectually believe this, what do we avoid according to this passage? And so what happens after, after the women uh, try to convince the men that they're not convinced, at least Peter decides, I'm going to run and check things out for myself. I'm going to go to the tomb. So verse 12. Uh, Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. So Peter goes, and he marvels. So the question is, well, did Peter get it at this point? And I think the answer is no. I don't think Peter's gone all the way to actually convince that Jesus has been ri ri uh, raised from the dead. And the reason why I think that is in, in verse 38, Jesus finally has to physically appear to his disciples, and this is what happens. Jesus said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when Jesus had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, Jesus said to them, do you have anything to eat? Which I just, I just love that. Uh, and there's a full sermon around that at some point. Jesus in his resurrected body is always hungry and always eating things. I don't know what that means, but that's interesting. <clears throat> but what, what actually is relevant for our sermon this morning is the disciples still do not believe even though they are marveling. You can, you can look at the church, Jesus, what we're doing this morning, and sort of be like, this is pretty cool. Or especially on a day like today. It's 75 and sunny. I mean, if you're like, if you got the grumps today, then I don't know what to do with you. Because it's like, it's the, it is a beautiful day. We woke up, we're just all marveling right now. We got our best clothes on, good meal planned later today. And if all you do is just walk through this day marveling and never stop to read the sign. Like, if Jesus is raised from the dead, you are entering into a wilderness where a human being is alive. Like, he was dead, and now he's alive, and he's loose in the world. The warning of Easter is you cannot stop at marveling. Do not stop at marveling. It's not enough. So what are we to do? And the answer is given by the angel to the women at the tomb. As they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men, the angel, said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. 
Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered into the handful or into the sins of hand, the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. The angels say to the women, Remember what Jesus said. So we're not to stop at marveling, we're to move into remembering what Jesus said. So what did Jesus say? What is, what is the promise to Easter? What are the words of him we are to, to remember? So what does Easter promise then? If we're to remember Jesus' words, and in those words are, is a promise, what is the promise of Easter? And, and I want to go back to the very first sermon of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. It's Luke chapter 4. Jesus is in his hometown. He's giving his very first sermon. And so he, he's basically laying out, like, this is who I am. This is who I claim to be. And he quotes from Isaiah 61, and he reads uh, that text and says, this is me. And Jesus says, the spirit on the Lord, of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. Jesus has good news for the poor and freedom for prisoners. But the promise of Easter to me ultimately is the freedom Jesus promised back in Luke 4. Freedom. So what freedom does Easter give us? Well, first is freedom from guilt and shame. One of my other favorite places in the world to go is, is Costco. This is Glacier National Park, Costco. Uh, and the reason is because I can go to Costco and feed and clothe and provide for my family of six and just go to this one place. Or, like, I try to imagine what it would have been like to live on Kansas in the prairie like 200 years ago. Like, what it would have, like how hard it would have been to feed and provide for my family in the wilderness and in the, on the prairie. Now I just go to, I just go to Costco. Um, and when I go to Costco, uh, obviously I load my cart up pretty. Like I got six, we got six people, so there's a lot of stuff in the cart. But one of the things, again, as a no-nuance person, uh, one of the things that's always just confused me about uh, Costco is the receipt person at the door. So I'm wheeling up there. I got a cart full of stuff. And I hand them the receipt, and they, like, they just give a quick glance. They check it off, and then I move on. And I'm just like, there's no way. No way. You just went through that receipt in a thorough fashion and made sure that everything in that cart matches the receipt. There's zero chance that just happened. And it's, for whatever reason, that's always bothered me. Um, but what's happening is ultimately, is, hey, all of that stuff, whether you paid for it or not, it's, it's paid for. You may go free. And one of the central messages of the resurrection from 1 Corinthians 15 is that if you believe in Christ, his resurrection means you are free from guilt and shame. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 17, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. But Christ has been raised, which means you are not in your sins any longer. Because all of us, listen, all of us, we have a receipt of things. We think when we get near to God, he's going to have to look through that. Right? Things we're guilty of past memories that if they're recounted to us, bring us great, great shame, deep regrets we have. And, and we, th there's no way, right? If you get to, the, if you get to, the, get to God, he's not going to look that receipt over and be like, no, nah, you got to go back. But what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 15 is, if Jesus has been raised from the dead, God has less interest in what you're, is on your receipt than Costco guy has on what's on my Costco receipt. It's been paid for. You are free. If Christ has been raised from the dead, you are free from guilt and shame. Just let that, let that sink in. Everything that you feel guilty over, everything that, that has kept you up at night, everything that you think would disqualify you from the presence of God, God is less interested in those things than the person at Costco checking your receipt. Because Jesus... When he went to the cross, he took on your guilt and shame. Then he died, and, and your guilt and shame was buried with him in the grave. And when he raised from the dead into new life, he did not raise with all of our guilt and shame. He raised in freedom to free us from those things so that we can sing with the ancient 
him, well may the accuser roar of ills that I have done. I know them all and thousands more. But God, he knows not one. If Christ has been raised, you are, not, you are free from guilt and shame. You're also free from the fear of death. And one of my tasks as a pastor is to, to do funerals to meet with grieving families. And um, that's always a sacred moment when you're with a family after someone has just died. And almost inevitably, something always happens as you're gathering with that family. Laughter. At some point, you push past the tears, the mourning, the deep grief, and you start laughing about the person that has been lost. It's a, it's a sacred moment, and, and in that moment, you feel for a moment that the person's back with you, that death wasn't the end, that they're, they're present there with you in a meaningful, powerful way. And there's something about that human experience that it feels like death should not be the end. There's a, there's a fear attached to death that I, I think is worth us meditating on and pursuing and not just pushing back. Why is that? If the gospel is true, if the resurrection is true, then one of the, one of the things that happened is Jesus, obviously, he, he died, he went into a grave, and he broke out of the tomb three days later, which means he's actually alive right now. Like, Jesus is somewhere right now. He's not dead, and his body didn't decay. Like, he's alive somewhere right now. So what's he doing? In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul, one of the people who actually claimed he saw Jesus after Jesus was died and resurrected, Paul says, Jesus, this is what he's doing. He is, he is going around the world preparing to make all things new, and he's defeating everything evil one at a time, and the last thing he's going to defeat is death itself. And then Paul says, For as a man came death, by a man comes also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. The Jesus, he's loose somewhere in the world right now, and he is making all things new. He's preparing the final resurrection, and those who are in Christ have no fear of death because Jesus is alive and loose in the world right now, going around inviting you to take him in faith so that death is not the end. And I fully acknowledge, like, that is a naive statement to make because, again, people don't just come back from death. It's never happened save one time. So how do we believe that? And listen, there's, lot, again, lots of good intellectual uh, reasons to, um, to believe in the resurrection. But here, like, just for a minute, think of all the stories that end in resurrection that we tell, right, the movies. And I, listen, I'm, gonna, I'm sorry if you haven't seen some of these, you're about to get spoiled, and it's not, it's not my problem at this point. You've had plenty of time. But Lord of the Rings, right, Gandalf the Grey, he, he dies. And then he comes back as Gandalf the White. Uh, Harry Potter. Maybe I'll save that one since there's kids in the room. Or The Matrix. None of you are ever going to watch The Matrix again. Uh, Neo, it, he dies. And then what happens? Trinity, which is like, oh, this, I mean, this is a little thick. Trinity basically says, I love you, Neo. And Neo comes back to life. Or last week, or a couple weeks ago, my wife and I went through uh, WandaVision. It's like, it's just Disney Plus, it's Marvel, just a cheap thrill. And yet it's, a, it's about death not being the end. We keep telling these stories. And listen, if ultimately scientific materialism is true, you know, natural selection evolution is true, why did the resurrection gene make it through all of the natural selection? Right? If the final word of this universe is survival of the fittest, we all die, why does no one believe it? Why do we laugh when we talk about people we've lost? Why does even WandaVision have a story of resurrection in it? Because we, in our hearts, know there's someone loose in the world right now who's putting it into death. And if you believe in him, you can be free from the fear of death. But the last thing I want to I say to you this Easter about what the promise of Easter means is that, that Jesus is seeking you. The reason Jesus died in the grave and came out three days later was not to be like, you know, ta-da, like magic trick. It, it, is, it is to find you and your, your bondage, your broken life, what, what weighs you down and to free you. He's looking for you. So my guess is at this point, y'all, we, all, we all got two questions, which is, Tim, did you walk past that sign and go on the hike into bear country? And did you see a bear? 
Yes and yes. I was in Glacier uh, because I, I try to take a year each, each or a week each year to go and, and pray. And in 2020, required some drastic intervention, like driving to Montana by myself and going where bears could, you know, eat me. Um, and so I, I was there and um, to, to pray and to see God and really just just kind of unravel what what was a, a traumatic, intense, frustrating, disappointing year with lots of relational loss, spiritual loss, emotional. I mean, just it was a heavy year for all of us. I'm sure in your own way, 2020 brought incredible hardship and, and new realities to you. And so I'm there, and, uh, and one of the hikes I chose to go on was the, the uh, it's called Sayi Pass, which is incredible. If you're ever there, you should, you should do this. Um, although, interesting side note, I, I learned after the fact, they really tell you, do not go on this hike alone, because this is one of the places where bears frequent most, which I didn't know. That's, hence the signs, I guess. But, uh, <laughs> but I went in, and, and as, as I'm on the hike, um, I see at a pretty safe distance a grizzly bear in, in the wild, just taking a swim in a pond. I just, I just paused in that moment and, and sat down. You know, there are enough people on the trail I, I felt like I could outrun um, if the bear turned and came after us. So I was good. So I sat down, and I just, I just watched him. And I could just listen. If you're comfortable, if you're a little charismatic, you just, I, could, I just had an experience with, with God in that moment. Where the first thing, this, is, this sounds weird, but since God just saying, look, isn't that bear awesome? Which just, it was. It was true. And then we just, I just worked through so much of the last few months of what, what I had gone through. And, and just felt God's presence there. And like for some of you, 2020, man, it brought stuff. And none of it mattered in that moment. Present to God, present to myself, present to his world. All of it was irrelevant. And ultimately, what the resurrection means is you all, listen, you, didn't have, you don't have the stuff from 2020 I've got, but you've got your stuff. That weighs you down, that wears you out, that makes you wonder, is this world good? Right? Am I, am I at this alone? Is this end just in suffering and, and pain? And what, what Easter Sunday announces to you and me is, is Jesus is alive and loose in the world and he's looking for you. And he wants to find you and he wants to break you free. Of whatever it is that's, that's got you, that's holding you back. It's the whole reason he rose from the dead. And so, yes, this, this world is deeply flawed and broken. There's a lot of reasons not to believe in a resurrection when you look around the world among us. This world is deeply broken, and your safety is not guaranteed. Anything can attack you without warning and for no apparent reason. And it probably will, and it probably already has. And yet, we, we stand at the trailhead of Easter, and we move into a, a, an uncertain world, not ignoring the sign, right? Not just walking right past it, laughing and giggling, ignorant to the world that's around us. We go in fully knowing this is a, a, a world where death currently reigns, but that Jesus has gotten loose in it, and death will not reign forever. Because Jesus, when he went on a cross, he took all of our guilt and shame, all of all the things that we think accumulate on the receipt that means God would never listen to us, never hear us, never pray, never respond to us. He does not care. It's paid for. It went in the grave with Jesus. All of the brokenness of this world that weighs you down, that wears you out, that went into the grave with Jesus. That death itself, the great enemy, went into the grave with Jesus himself. And Jesus came out three days later, to break free from all of that, to break our world free of all of that guilt and that shame, of all of the brokenness and evil that's present in our world, to break free of death itself. And he is loose in the world right now. And he broke out, he broke free to break you free. Let's pray. Father, we gather because we announce that Jesus is not dead, but is alive. And every one of us in this room needs that for different reasons. Every one of us in this room needs it. But every one of us in this room have so many reasons not to believe it. To not welcome it, to not hear it. And to not, when Jesus, you, you come up alongside us and make yourself known to us, to not, to not release and let you speak. So God, we, we need to meet with the present living 
raised Jesus from the dead. And I pray, Jesus, by your spirit, go to work on us. Amen. to our time of communion. Tim had referenced 1 Corinthians 15, 17, that if Christ has not raised from the dead, then we, we are all stuck in our sin. And when we come to these elements, a lot of times we think about forgiveness of sin, being connected to Jesus' death, but if that's all that happened was Jesus died, then, then we're in no better of a place. That, that we needed Jesus to raise from the dead, to defeat death. And so as we come to the table, as we come to this meal together, it's in light of not only his death, but also his resurrection. And so if you uh, have not grabbed one of these cups yet, uh, go ahead and go to the back. You can grab one, or there may be one in front of you in your seat. And we'll go ahead and stand now. And before we have this meal together, uh, we will confess the Apostles' Creed. So together, Christians, what is it that you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. If you're able to confess that, then this meal is for you. And if you have questions about that or, or don't believe that yet and want to, come talk to Tim or me or Andrew uh, after the service. And so on the night of Jesus' betrayal, he took bread and he broke it. And he handed it to his disciples and he said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat.
And in the same way, he took a cup and he passed it to his disciples. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant of my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. Amen. Sing this out together. Go to sin.
Jesus' face. Sing one more time. Oh, praise the name. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore for endless days. We will sing Your praise, O Lord, O Lord our God. Oh, Lord. Savior say. I hear the Savior say, thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid. Jesus paid it all. Thank you for making uh, your Easter day, or having us be a part of your Easter day of worship. And if you are, if you're looking for a church community, uh, in the weeks ahead, we're going to be moving from our series on Luke to a series on joy in Philippians. I've, I've already given you a jump start. If you want to increase your joy, go to Glacier National Park and Costco. Uh, but we're going to go more into depth of how Jesus speaks into that joy uh, experience. So we hope to see you back <coughs> um, next week. But I want to leave us with a word from 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, just as a, a promise to you and I, that if your faith is in Jesus, you, you live in victory. Now you're free. 
Um, so if you're comfortable, raise your hands to receive this. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your string, sting? Thanks be to God who has given us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. May you go in his peace. Mm-hmm.